If you look around, there are so many ways to make a difference. At Capella University, our FlexPath format gives you a different way to earn your degree. Take courses at your speed. Move on whenever you're ready. Education should fit your life. Learn more at capella.edu. With one of the best savings rates in America, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than choosing Slash to be in your band. Next up for lead guitar. You're in. Cool. <laughs> yep, even easier than that. And with no fees or minimums on checking and savings accounts, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank for details. Capital One and a member FDIC. Welcome to the uh, From the Shadows podcast. I am your host, Shane Grove. Uh, and before we get started in this episode, uh, I just want to let all of our regular paranormal uh, listeners, you know, the people that may not listen to our midweek howl. Um, sadly, uh, on Easter Sunday, Jason, the super producer, passed away um, early in the morning. Um, he, he could not... Uh, he, he, he battled for a long time, um, some effects from uh, COVID that damaged his uh, kidneys. And unfortunately, this last month was a pretty rough month. And, uh, you know, Jason, you know, Jason didn't make it. So, um, but if you want to go back, we're going to do, we did a special episode, uh, me and the judge and the howler, uh, kind of reminisce and talking about Jason a little bit, because I'm sure he'd love it. Um, and I'm sure he's listening and probably wishes he could chime in. So, uh, but I just wanted to let everybody know, because as we've gone through uh, Jason battling this, uh, this illness that he's had, you know, I know a lot of you guys out there have reached out uh, through Instagram and Facebook and sent emails and text messages uh, and wishing Jason well and uh, praying for him. And, you know, he got all those messages. I passed them along as best I could, but he did know that uh, everybody was pulling for him and he really appreciated it all the way up to the end. So just wanted to let everybody know it's, it's not the greatest way to start out an episode. Trust me, it was not the greatest way to start out Easter Sunday. Um, but, you know, we're going to carry on in Jason's memory. And, uh, you know, that's, that's exactly what he would have wanted. And, uh, you know, he was always one that wanted to have a paranormal experience. Uh, and he had a couple, a couple with some ghosts and, uh, we're just kind of wondering like, uh, when it is that he's going to find the op- most opportune time to scare me or the judge or the howler when, when it's, uh, when it's least expected, you know, that's the kind of sense of humor Jason has. So, uh, you know, just keep his, his wife and his sister and her husband and uh, the rest of his family in your prayers. Um, it's a tough time, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll all make it through it and we'll, we'll keep remembering Jason. And like I said, if you want to hear, uh, go back to Wednesday's episode, um, the midweek how we, uh, we, we, you know, we talk about Jason, have, have some laughs and, um, it's just just how we would have wanted it. So, so all right. Well, enough sadness. But I just want to remind everybody that if if you have an uh, an experience or uh, an encounter that you want to share with us, you can find us at uh, from the shadows podcast on Facebook or after the shadows our forum page on Facebook. You can find me at Shane Grove Author on Instagram. Uh, or from the Shadows Podcast on Instagram, or you can just go to our website from the Shadows Podcast, hit the contact button, and send us an email. I promise I'll read it, and I will get back to you. Um, 
because we love to hear from uh, our listeners and especially the people who have encounters that they would like to share, which brings me to our guest today, uh, whose son actually reached out to me um, and told me and shared with me some, I mean, this is kind of an amazing story, folks, so I can't wait to bring uh, this this gentleman on and have him share it with you. So, Carl, welcome to the From the Shadows podcast. Hello, uh, Shane. Um, I'm pleased to be here with you all. We are pleased to have you. So, so Carl, your son Adam reached out to me and kind of filled me in. I didn't want him to give me too many details, but he, he shared enough to uh, to for me to know that you had a crazy well, more than one crazy experience during your time in the military. So if you would go ahead and, and kind of let everybody, let all our listeners know, like what time period we're talking about, what branch of the service you were in, and let's just kind of go down the road and, and tell us what it is that happened to you. Well, the, the time period was, uh, I would wait. I was in the air. I was in the Air Force. I was an airman second class in the Air Force. And the time period, 1965, uh, and uh, it was uh, September the 1st of September. And I thought, boy, I'm going to have a good time. I just got paid from last month, you know, uh, you know, at the end of the month, you get paid. And I said, I'm going to have a good time because my uh, sergeant said that I could go down to the railhead and unbrace a, uh, a snow removal truck. And as soon as I got that done, I could have the rest of the day off. So I figured it'd take me about two hours to do it. And I'd go down there and unbrace this, this big snow removal truck. It was a piece of cake. I could do it in about two, I told you about two hours. So I was, while I was down there working, uh, just, uh, while I was down there working, I got just a little bit of the job done. And then over the, over the top of the hills, there at the end of the red, red, red I mean, railhead, there, there was a, a, a row of trees. And then over the top of the row of trees came a flying saucer. And it came in and, and it flew right over my head, right there. And I didn't know what to do. I was surprised and bewildered, you know what I mean? And uh, so I, 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 it was getting too close to me. So I took and I said, oh, feet don't fail me now. And I started running and, and, and foolish as I was, because uh, I was, you know, I wasn't paying no attention where I was. I was unfamiliar with the place in the first place. I ran into a big thicket of, of a, a long growing grass. You know, I thought it was pretty much like the rest of the base was all mowed and everything. So I just ran right into, you know, big bunch of grass. Anyway, big thicket's what it was. I, well, I said that. But. Uh, then it got real close to me, and then a, it, a, like a, a shoot tank came down toward me, and I was I was actually backed up. And uh, and the reason I did that was because after I said feet don't fill me now, and I was running, I heard the uh, the, the the ship say in my own words, repeat it right to me, feet don't fill me now, and that kind of confused me too. So uh, anyway, this this this. Uh, like like it was coming down, like a, a little chute was coming down and, and was laid right there in front of me. And I thought, he, you know, like it looked like a mailbox thing, you know, where you could lift the handle and, and put the in. So I took and uh, I pulled out an IBM card, one of them, uh, you know, that uh, it has 80, well, an IBM card. And I said, if you think you're so smart here, and I, I was going to take him. Put it in, I thought it was going to be like a like a mailbox. So it, it sounds kind of nuts, but you know, it's a surprise to me. But anyway, it opened up, and when it opened up, they were two grays on the other side, and one of them grabbed one arm, and the other one grabbed the other arm. And as soon as they did that, I didn't know it at the time, but a little gray head snuck up behind my back, and he touched me right in the back of the head with a wand, and I was limp as a dish rag. And they took me aboard the, the craft. And then uh, I was on air. And this was uh, Friday morning. And I was on air for uh, Friday, Saturday. And then Sunday night, they brought me back. And when they brought me back, 
That was September the 3rd. And that was the incident in Exeter. And what they did was they dropped me off. But I, while I was there, I communicated them a little bit. They were, they were just checking me out and, and giving me some, uh, you know, like uh, checking my body out and uh, asking me a few questions. That was about it, you know. And so uh, it, I got off and I thought, boy, that was fast, you know, in a way. But I'd actually been there for three days almost. So now when I got off the ship, it was uh, late. It was, uh, wait, early Monday morning almost. It was, they dropped me off the Sunday night in the morning, you know, like it was way, way late at night. Yeah, like one, one or two in the morning or something like no, that. No, it was like about four or five because I thought it was going to, I, you know, I, because I got off. And I was kind of confused, and I, I thought I was still working on the job. So I started working and, and finished bracing the thing, and all of a sudden the, the sun, the sun's going, going up instead of down because I thought it was going down. You know what I mean? So uh, then I went into the to the barracks, and then I started getting flashbacks. You know what happened to me? So then uh, then uh, I, I, I went to work that day. I had to even go. I, I didn't have no time. After I'd been gone for three days, and I went into work, it's like I worked that. I actually had to work for a whole two weeks in a row, practically. So, I uh, I went into work and I told everybody what happened. And then after that, they had like the OSI and stuff like that check me out, and, and that that was why I was on base. And then uh, then I heard it on the radio that you know, like TV and stuff that they had an incident in Exeter. And and uh, all the police the people in the police department, everybody up in Exeter knows everybody else. So uh, uh, so I took and uh, told everybody. And then after the OSI, the unit, they came over and asked me all kinds of questions. Did I talk to them? I said, yeah, I talked to them. He said, how did you communicate? Why, what language were they speaking? I said, it was telecommunication. I, I could hear them talk, you know, just as plain as you, you know, that was sort of it in my head. And uh, so after that, uh, that later on that day, the uh, about that day, I believe it was that day or that e- uh, maybe a, a next day after that, the, uh, the, 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 the police department asked the air base if they had it, any information on the UFO that, that everybody saw over in Exeter. So they um, and the base commander said, "You know as much about it as we do. You know we we don't we don't know anything about it. You're the only people. You just know what you tell us. You know that sort of thing. So you don't have to hit me in the head with a hammer. No, I've been hit. So when the boss says mum's the word, it mum's the word because anybody back in those days that spoke anything about a flying saucer, if you was an air pilot, you lost your job." They, I knew that, and I said, well, I don't want to endanger my career or anything like that. So I went on about my business. And so after that, and then the next thing you know, I get picked up again. And then after that, they they, they give me sort of like an IQ test, you know. And then it, then after that, I get, uh, I get the, the base, uh, not the base commander, but a bunch of lower affiliates you know, colonels and stuff like that hanging around me. And they're telling me that uh, the aliens want to use me for uh, an ambassador, you know, basically. And I thought, well, I, you know, when they come here, because I'm friendly with them, they'll talk to me and I'll talk to you guys. You know, that sounds all right. But it wasn't like that at all from what I gather later on. This was the incident in Exeter was actually a prelude to uh, what they call it, uh, a prelude to uh, what he said, a reticuli where they had a planet up there where the people were going to take and volunteer to go away for uh, uh, about like the, like the like to go and, and and be part of like yeah no go there and live there you know and okay. uh, so that that was that was it so then uh, they checked me out and everything but they wouldn't take me but they liked me because. When, whenever one of the aliens would talk to me, I didn't only hear what he was saying. I could actually see what he was thinking, you know, where a lot of them just picked up on the, like the sound business. But uh, 
anyway, I'm an artist, and I think I can see things more pictorially than other people. So then what happened was um, at the end of the program, they told me, they said, uh, for being part of the program, you can you can name anything in the universe. You know, they had the whole thing. It was a, they had like a hologram of the universe, and it was like a, like old fashioned bumper pool players, but the on the thing on top was clear glass. It was like milk glass on it, and it was about like about seven feet or eight feet by about five feet. You know, and uh, it was a hologram, and it showed the, the entire universe above it. And it was one of the, you know, one of the, that was the second time I seen a hologram. And the, but one of the first times I seen it was before that when they was testing me out. But the idea was like, so they, they, they write down on this piece of paper with a blue piece of paper. And I wrote on it, uh, I, I, I'm going to name the brightest spot in the universe. And, it, you know, and instead of giving my name, I wrote 15704307. That's my Air Force number. And so uh, I thought it would be something like an M80, you know, a really bright spot in the universe that I knew then the universe was just, you know, within this galaxy, basically. But the point is, is there's billions of galaxies. So they, they knew that, but I didn't know that. But the brightest spot in the universe is gigantic galactic clusters. So when... That when they named the, the the gigantic galactic clusters, they they always start the name of it is and it's like one five seven oh six nine or two or something like that. But it's you know it's always smaller than one five seven oh four three oh seven because that's the brightest spot. You know what I mean? Okay, I got you. Yeah. And <clears throat> anyway, the reason I couldn't, they said I was maladjusted. And, you know, to, you know, like, uh, and, and I thought to myself, yeah, I guess I am. I, I grew up over the Rhine and I fought practically every other day. Everybody down there did. And uh, that would kind of make you maladjusted a little bit. I'm aggressive, you know, and uh, everybody was aggressive. But a lot of people, they live in a, you know, a, a a pampered life existence and they don't they don't have confrontation all the time so i you know i can see that but they did like me and uh, i met with uh, three different kinds of aliens basically and uh, one one type was uh, the little bitty ones and they they were like uh the, the grunts you know they were the smaller ones of the bunch and then you had the taller ones which was sort of like the intellectual the one that run the show the big i am and then these were the grays. And then you have, and then I seen one female uh, looked like a praying mantis in a face, but it had a body that resembled uh, like a, a lizard, you know, kind of, it had, you know, it had skin like a lizard. But it, it was a really nice person, very nice to talk to and everything, you know, and got along just fine, and, you know. Oh, if you're going to talk between the rest of them, the easiest one to get along with was the was the uh, the ones that were uh, uh, what do you call it uh, more snake like or what do you call it a dragon like reptilian like the reptilian yeah, a reptilian yeah <clears throat> so uh, it was uh, it was really interesting but uh, uh, it, and and when I was around the reptiles you could have bright light but when I was around the grays. I always want it to be really dark. You know what I mean? Being, you know, what do you, handle, did, did they you know? explain? Did they explain why that was at all? No. Other than maybe the reptilians like the had, heat from the light or something. I don't know. Yeah, but they had humans working with them. And when I'd go in and meet a human, they would, uh, the place was well lit. But you know what? There was no source of the light. Now, I'm an artist, and I pay attention to where the light's come from. This place never had any shadows, but it was clear. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The thing was clear and easy to see. No shadow. It was weird. Uh, uh, oh, they asked me if I had any questions. I was always uh, kind of interested in uh, <coughs> physics a little bit. You know, I just I was interested in how the how atoms were put together and how they made, you know, that sort of thing. So I said, w what do you think the smallest particle is? in the universe, you know, and what your thing is. 
And so they, that's when they showed me the first time I seen a hologram. They uh, they took me over by like the table, and they they showed me a big giant blow up of a, a huge hydrogen atom. <clears throat> and so I looked at it and I thought, that's a I know what that is. That's a hydrogen atom. And I said, if you think that's the smallest particle in the universe, I said you've got big problems. And they said, no, that that's not what we're trying to show you. Well, so they took then from that hydrogen atom, they took the electron on the outside of the atom and then broke it down into two photons. And then they took one of the photons and broke it down into quirks, you know. And then it, it broke the quirks down. You had, you had six main quirks. <coughs> one is uh, uh, charisma, charm, and uh, strange. Left in charisma, charm, strange, right. They're the opposite of each other, and they attract each other. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And as soon as they attract each other, and then and then they looked at like a little silver dollar floating in the air, and as soon as they attract each other, in the center of it would appear another quirk, just same as the rest of them, but it just appeared. But if you took one of the uh, the the, the uh, uh, quirks away. He never had all six of them, you, you know, the three of them, uh, two, uh, each one of them opposite of each other. And if you never had in perfect harmony, the one in the center wouldn't show up. So it was working by a symbiotic relationship. So I still didn't know why it would work. I just knew that when they were together, that would happen. But they, they kind of demonstrated to me that these things... They, Whenever one of them would come, they, you'd get a feeling. See, they'd give me a feeling, you know. I guess you call it a chakra. And then uh, and then you'd feel, you know, you'd feel that and then get another chakra. And you could feel that and you get another chakra. And you'd feel that. And, but I never could feel the center chakra. You know, like when, when the H-field particle came up. And I said, I, I still don't get it. And, and one, of the, one of the persons in the background said, How's he supposed to get it? He's psychologically disturbed. But he, the the uh, the alien, the gray alien, he said, he might be psychologically disturbed, but his logic is an absolute. So uh, they kept showing it over and over again, and then I felt that, I felt that seventh chakra, and when I did that, it was the first time I actually can remember actually feeling like a real human being. You know what I mean? And that's kind of weird. Yeah, I mean, like, like talking about like the science stuff is totally foreign. <laughs> foreign. I mean, I can follow along, but but it like can't. So you're saying it made you feel like a human being in a sense that everything kind of made sense. Well, I what? well, it was like if you don't have all your if you don't have all your emotions in line with each other. Okay. And and you if you got them all in line with each other all your emotions, then you can think outside of your emotional problems and be more like creative and, and think about other things, you know, I, you know, just be free of, free of, of worrying about anything. It was like you was feeling completely released of all, all things. And well, w w what I got from them was, even though it was just a small pho photon, those aliens think that even that, photon was alive, you know, and so, you know, uh, uh, they think that the entire universe is a live creature, you know, and that's, that's really weird, but uh, it, it's hard to express. <clears throat> what do you think of those apples? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, you know, I'm looking out my window and I'm looking at the yard and the trees and stuff and, and, and you know, and you're saying like the, and you look out there and everything I can see is alive. Yeah, in but a matter, he, in a manner of speaking, right? Yeah, but even even anything mechanical has even everything. You thought you stop and think of it. A crystal grows. How can it grow it, 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 if it ain't alive? Yeah, you know what I mean. And it's solid as a rock. Just because something's solid doesn't mean it doesn't. It, it's not aware of itself. You know, it's weird. But that took me a long time to figure that one out. <laughs> Yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say, I mean, I'm, yeah, that was, that's kind of, that's kind of a deep, uh, deep notion for sure. Yeah, so. and I never, 
Listen, I never did go back to, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, Exeter again. You know, I had a girlfriend out there and everything, but I never went back there again. And I never and I never told nobody about what happened. And because when I was debriefed from 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 my affiliation with the aliens, that they told me not to talk about it for 20 years. And I said I wouldn't. And I didn't. I never talked about it to about 1984 or something like that. And, uh, you know, I, I stayed clear of that subject. And and beside that, I was working. I didn't want to. People back in those days, as you said something about the aliens, uh, they can you know, lose your job and everything. Well, okay, so Carl, I took notes because there's some things I, I there's things I want to ask you, uh-huh. and I'm sure there's I'm sure the listeners are like, okay, we want to we want to know some questions. So, so the first time that you said you saw the ship, like you didn't hear anything, you just saw this ship come over the no, trees. It, it came come- over. Uh, I saw it, and they had it. The bottom of it was uh, <clears throat> it looked like it looked it like a like the bottom of a diamond, and it was okay. it was crimson, but it was Chinese red, you know, sort of like an orange color. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and on the outside of it, it had uh, it had lights. It remind me of a merry-go-round. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was uh, it was. <clears throat> It, it looked like it was spinning, but it was still the beat. And if anybody was on that base, you'd had to be blind not to see it. You know what I mean? Some people might say coffee doesn't need chocolate, but you're not some people. You're a dreamer. You see the possibilities of chocolate and caramel flavors swirling together with cold brew, topped with velvety chocolate cold foam and cocoa caramel crumbles. That imagination can only be rewarded with Dunkin's new caramel chocolate cold brew. It's a cold brew dream come true. America runs on Dunkin'. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer terms apply. Some people might say coffee doesn't need chocolate, but you're not some people. You're a dreamer. You see the possibilities of chocolate and caramel flavors swirling together with cold brew, topped with velvety chocolate cold foam and cocoa caramel crumbles. That imagination can only be rewarded with Dunkin's new caramel chocolate cold brew. It's a cold brew dream come true. America runs on Dunkin'. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Terms apply. A fortune forecast update brought to you by the Ohio Lottery. Well, hey there, Ohio. We're tracking a lot of jackpot activity over the next few days. We have rolling cash five and lucky for life in the forecast the entire week. But we also have major drawings for Powerball moving in, followed by scattered Mega Millions drawings through the week with some classic lotto drawings popping up here and there as well. There are big drawings every day, so stay tuned to the Fortune Forecast Center for the latest jackpot developments. Lottery players are subject to Ohio laws and commission regulations. Please play responsibly. So you got sent down to the to the like where the rail, like the train came in, well, right? At the end of the base, practically, it's right next to Exeter. Okay, so how did, before I ask the next next question, this is another question, how did what you saw compare to what the events that took place in Exeter on the 3rd compare? Like, how did those compare? Like, I seen seen it in the daylight. Okay. But when they brought me back, they brought me back at night. So I don't know how they seen it, but that's the way I seen it. Okay. I mean, you never. You Let's never look that bad, you know. But when it was when it when, when it was coming back, it had to slow down to land on the base to get me off. I got you. Yeah, I got you. I didn't know if you'd ever went and like did any research on that uh, on those on those Exeter sightings. And see if what those eyewitnesses reported compared to what you saw. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Okay. It was an old red glove on the bottom of it. Okay. I mean, um, he's red. You know. I got you. Yeah. So now, when you so first, you obviously were scared. You didn't know what this thing was, and as it 
put the shoot down and you said you heard it or no, you said you heard it either in your head. So did you hear in your head it repeating what you said? Feet don't fail me Not now. Yeah, it was, you know, uh, they, it was either coming from the craft or they could have been sending me a, a thought because they could do that. You know, these aliens, they can send you communication. You, they're telepathic. <laughs> yes, yes. I've, I've heard that numerous, numerous times, for sure. Yeah. Um, and so, so at what point, though, did you, because, you know, you, so you said you kind of challenged this craft, like, okay, so you, you know, you think you're smart, you know, yeah. did, what, was there a point in time where you realized they were not going to hurt you, or you were just kind of like, okay, I got yeah. nothing to lose? Because when he touched me in the back of my head, I was limp as a dish rag. They took me on board the ship, and I they zoomed my my, my away. And when I came back, when they let me off, uh, uh, I didn't even know that I'd been gone that long until I got back to the barracks and started. I started. I you know I had like a like a. Uh, it takes you a long time to get over shock. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And and anyway, it hit me all of a sudden like. And I went, oh, my God, I've been gone for three days here. Because when I went back, I said, you know, I'm getting ready to go. To, I thought I was going to go to bed, and I had to go to work. I think what he's asking, what's that? I think what he's asking is, at what point did you go from being afraid of the craft to suddenly wanting to interact with it? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I was, oh. that's kind of what I was getting with. Yeah, because it sounded like at first you, you were like, oh, I'm running, until you kind of got caught in the grass. And then you kind of challenged the ship a little bit and said okay you, you you're so smart what's this car you know what's on this card yeah here here right? well one of, the, one of the smartest thing we make is an ibm card you know we use it for computer yeah. stuff and so they dropped a little thing down there i and i didn't see the aliens there till the door flipped open when the door flipped open it was two aliens standing there and they grabbed me by my arms they you know they're little aliens and they're strong for their size and then one one little alien came up behind me and tucked me in the back of the head with a wand. And when he tucked me in the back of the head with a wand, I was a lip as a dish rag. And I I I just went along about the business. He went right up the staircase there with him, and uh, went on board the craft. So, so do you? Th- so, obviously, you came to find out that the military knew what was going on. Yeah. Right? I'm- Better keep your mouth shut about it. If you if you know, you want to you know. But do you, but but do but, you think that nobody now did did either nobody realize you were gone for three days because it was your you were go, supposed to go on leave and be gone for three days and nobody well, cared what you were doing or is it because they knew you hit something had happened? Well, I figured that they were testing the government was testing people to be. Uh, ambassadors to this planet see but they didn't tell me it was a planet i thought i was just going to be an ambassador so they they would take guys and and have them check down there that go down there on the like they think they're going to go for three day easy you know like you go down there and unbreak this truck and you get you only takes you about an hour or so and then you got the rest of the day off that's like a three-day weekend that's a wonder boy that's a break you know a, a guy give you know like a Twenty dollars, forty, fifty dollars to to get a day off, and because a three day weekend, you could you could go into Boston or something, else, not just stand within twenty five miles of space, you know. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it was really a big thing. So I thought, well, I got this, I got my money, I'm going to have a good time on the old town tonight. And I had girlfriends, you know. I wasn't a bad looking guy back in those days, you know. Not, <laughs> <laughs> You know, I dance like Jagger. I'm only kidding. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So they, I just, the the thing that blows my mind is, is how does, how did they think people were going to just want to go somewhere for 20 years? And what on earth? They got them. They got 12 of us. I mean, there was more than 12 people that volunteered. They had all the volunteers to meet together. Okay, the, so so did, so did all, the, the ones that was already contracted out to them, they weren't there. That was the last. And each one of those guys that volunteered was able to take and 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 
uh, name a part of the solar system, in, in like probably some place on Jupiter or some a moon on Jupiter, something like that, or anything that they they could show you pictures of them, and then you could name it, and then it would be it. The thing is, I gave an abstract point. I said I want to name the brightest spot in the universe. And it's it's actually a, a gigantic galactic cluster. Now all gigantic galactic clusters starts off at one five seven, and those are dimension dominion oh demissiations of what the really brightest spot in the universe is. I know what the number is or it should be. It's one five seven oh four three oh seven, and I don't know if the Hubble can see that for or not. But the aliens can. Well, what I what I was just I was wondering though is. So how do so those people that left and and went for twenty years? What did they tell their families? Did they not have families? I mean, how? What's the story that that they, gets? They was get, uh, they, I, I, the way I figured it was the family never knew. They volunteered and then they was committed to like missing in action, or they told them they got they committed suicide or something like that and left. And the, they, that's supposed to be like. Uh, Two girls and twelve guys, or twelve people all together. Might well, that be ten guys and two girls who went there? You know, it's like a, a fourth or fifth planet. And that it to wreck? You know that? Uh, I, I forget the name of the thing. Anyway, uh, uh, the uh, they're they're there. And about it was about 1980 they came back. You know, so, so they did. So these people came back. They was on the floor of them and came back. You know, it takes about six months to get there. Even if they was going faster than the speed of light, and it still takes about six months to get there. Wow. So so what was the purpose? Did you ever figure out, find out what the per were you told of the per what the purpose was for uh, for going and spent you know, spending the, all this time there? Uh, run it by me again. I said I said, did you did you ever find out? Did they explain to you? I mean what exactly was the purpose? Just to take a human there to see how they would fare or so they could study somebody more closely or, or what? I mean, like, what was the purpose of taking people for 20 years? They took them there to see how they lived. And uh, they already live here, you know, the aliens. But they, since they, they wanted to have somebody to go there, of, of, you know, and live. And then, and then, if they wanted to come back, if they wanted to stay, they could stay, you know. And um, mm -hmm. some of them stayed, some of them died while they were there, and then some of them came back, you know. But there weren't too many come back, you know. How would you, when you're living with those people, you're living like uh, 10, 10, 15,000 years ahead of we. Who would want to come back here? I remember when I'd, when I'd leave the aliens. And I'd come back, you know, away from them. I'd be there for a couple of days, and I'd come back after after being with them. And the next thing I know, I thought, "Oh, I'm back in the Stone Age again." <laughs> yeah. Well, if you were seeing, you know, well, look, I had Holly Grant. Any question I asked could be answered, and you could show me a picture of it. You know, all you had, you didn't have to type in nothing on their computers. All you had to do was just tell them. You know. Yeah. It, well, that's kind of how Google works now. <laughs> Google works now. It almost seems like you think of something, and the next thing you know, you get an ad for it. We don't get a hologram, but you know, we get an ad for it on our phone. <laughs> that's a, that's thanks for the. That's probably a, that's the alien technology that we humans got right. Is that we can get stuff from Google for thinking about it um, or talking about it. So, well, so I want to tell you something cute about them. When the little bitty ones walk. They walk with goose steps like little German officers. <laughs> like the little, so I was going to, I wrote that. They walk so like soldiers, goose stepping straight out. They really do. Because their head uh, weighs more than their body does practically. <laughs> so they have, to, they have to actually kick to make their body move where they're walking. So okay. they can get out. So the, so the little ones, do they look like just miniature grays? Yeah, but they're smaller. Their head's not quite as big. And uh, of the, they're the gung-ho. They're servants. They work. They're told what to They don't even tell them what to do. They practically know what to do. They're like they're born to a working job. So so let me ask this. In retro, in, in, so, the, so, of course, the Air Force obviously was in on, in on this. They knew something was 
they were working hand in hand with the aliens. Yeah. And they told me when when I left Pease to go, go go to Labrador, they told me not to speak anything about it. Not then and not for 20 years. Not to say anything had happened to me when I was at Pease Air Force Base. And I swore to it and I kept my word. I mean, I kept my word about it. Now, have you back then or since, have you run into anybody else in the military that has had a similar experience that you've talked to? Well, they was... There was this one little Japanese guy when I, he said, yeah, I was working with him. And that was before I went out to there. He said, man, I hate to go out to, to the uh, railhead. He said, I never want to do that again. And he was Japanese. I think his name was, uh, um, I forget his name. The hell, it, you know, it's been about 60 years ago. Yeah, it's been a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, but uh, there was a lot of guys started well, they was guys on the base that kind of knew about it, and they kept their mouth shut. And, you know, they you know, they were sworn to, but it, and and it was you. They was traits that people picked up all the time before they had a problem. And what what it was was they would have uh, nosebleeds and what they call it, uh, active virus. He said, "Don't look at him; you'll get it next." You know, because it, it, not a bunch of people never got it. Just kind of like one at a time, you know what I mean? And, and so that was active viruses. When they're checking you out physically, they they do some sort of manipulation with your eye or something, you know? Yeah, I I yeah, I get what you're saying. So yeah, I just wondered if that at some point, you know, you had run into somebody else who had experienced the same thing, and it was kind of a eureka moment, like, oh my god, yeah. I, this is what happened to me. I didn't know if you ever had had that opportunity to, um, you know, talk I, to somebody. I, talk to somebody. I hate to bring up his name, but I'll tell you his name anyway. Maybe I shouldn't, but his name was Stanislaw, and uh, he went to uh, right after he seen him. <clears throat> he and I know he's seen him. He went. He went to to uh, Alaska. Like. First name, his last so, Krasinski, but uh, he was a, he was good in math. So he was a guy that you were you were stationed with then. And yeah, then he, and he went and had the same sort of experience. Yeah, he, he then, lived in the same barracks that I did. And he got sent. Now, he, did he yeah, volunteer I, to go to Alaska, or did he get sent to Alaska? Yeah, I, well, I seen him bumming around. You know, at the last part there when we was uh, all got together, kind of, and. Uh, uh, I knew him, and we, uh, that's the only time I had all this bump shoulders together, was when they, was, they got all the 12 people they wanted, I guess, or we was, we were getting ready to go anyway, we, we were being sent away to different places, but what you would say, being put on ice, Stan Squaws went to Alaska, and I went to Labrador, and it gets mighty cold in Labrador, and it's a long way. There's not many people come up there. So what they so what happened is is the people that didn't end up going, who experienced it, they wanted to separate you and put you somewhere else. No, they where... didn't talking about it. Yeah, well, yeah, so, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is they separate separate you from other guys that might have that you could have talked about it with and yeah, sent you some, sent you someplace where you had other things to worry about. Yeah, if, you, if we'd have met each other, quite naturally, we'd be running our jibs, talking about our experience, because it's a common experience. But if they separate us, for, diffuse us far enough apart, we wouldn't we wouldn't have any chance of of, uh, of get, or, or, or getting a story straight. In fact, you might see a side of the story you see, and another guy see the same, you look, be in a room, and you get 12 guys in there, and they'll have 12 different views of that room. And each one of them will be right, but it's from his point of view. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to get that collective information together. That's not it. They want to defuse the information. So, Carl, let me ask you this. After all these years, and obviously this is a turning point in your life, having this experience, is it, do you have regrets that you didn't go? away for 20 to another planet for 20 years and and do that or 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 is it something that you didn't really even think about you just, I'm you, glad that they never accepted me because it, if they would have accepted me i'd have went because i would have done for my country to be you know be privileged to be 
an, an ambassador to someplace, you know, on, on the behalf of your nation. It's, you know, it's, it's a big esteem, it'd be a privilege to serve my nation. But <clears throat> but I'm glad they never never took me because of my aggressiveness, because I got my my sons, and I'm, I'm glad to have sons and I have a normal life. And uh, you can't ask for better than that, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what, so one other thing about these, uh, how long from September 1st, when you first got taken aboard the craft, so how long then a time period did all these other events take place before they reject, you know, didn't take you, you know, deem that you weren't somebody they were going to take? Like, was it a couple of weeks, a couple of months? Was it over a year? That was September. It was October, November, or something like that. Anyway, I was there. I, I talked with Curtis C. LeMay and the, a guy called Thor Hardall, and he ran for president. He was a senator out of New Hampshire. Thor Hardall was a good man. And it seemed, must have been just a couple of weeks after that that I was, you know, it didn't take long for them to pick, figure me out. So I'm probably maybe a, a, a month at the most before I went to Labrador. Because as two, after, you know, after that happened, I got, two weeks went by and I had to go through the debriefing on the base. You still there? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I'm listening. I'm just two, writing down two, notes here. Two weeks for debriefing. So, so it's probably about a month then, you're thinking. Yeah. Okay. Well, Carl, I'm going to tell you. Um, you know, uh, this is an amazing encounter, amazing story. I mean, I would love, um, I know we have listeners all over, all over the world. I, I'd love, because if they are doing, if they were doing this with the United States, they could, they had to be doing it with other uh, governments, you know, it probably couldn't have just been the United States. I'd love to hear uh, from people who, Either they had the same uh, similar experiences that you had, or they knew somebody somebody in their family did. Um, I I would hope somebody would reach out, you know, and uh, contact us. And and well, you know what? If back in those days, if you had real information and you contacted somebody, it could be really bad on you. Well, that's 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 the good thing is nowadays it's not like that. <laughs> you get a little bit afraid when you flew with the big man. Yeah. Nowadays, it's not like that. The, the people people aren't so afraid to reach out and they can even stay anonymous, but it would just be really, uh, be really neat to, to, to kind of make a connection with somebody else that uh, had the same experiences uh, that you did. So, um, but hey, Carl, I appreciate, I appreciate your service and that you were for the country and you were willing to go what most everybody listening is probably thinking more than the extra mile to serve the country to go to a to an alien uh, to an alien planet but uh, I, i'm glad you i'm glad you could share this with us and and tell everybody the story i think it, i think it's important for uh, this experience to get out and for people to to hear about what happened to you yeah how about those uh, those guys that left you know they, they... I, I got, I got, I, I can't believe, I can't believe it. And it, I mean, they should be welcomed as Hindenburg. Yeah, you they know? should be, they should be, they should, they are real. They would be, should be considered real heroes. But, you know, you said four people came back. Man, what happened to those guys? You know, oh, they weren't, they weren't recognized. They weren't, they never got no popcorn, you know, uh, what, what, they never had no parade on <laughs> Wall yeah. Street thing. Yeah, uh, they, exactly. They, they were shunned, completely shunned by by the wherewithal that's who is with all that, you know, in uh whatever whatever way they the people that's in charge wants to write history, they can write it. People like me, they can write us right out of history that fast. Well, hey, look, you're you're gonna have a piece your your piece of history is gonna have a voice. So people are going to be able to hear your piece of history. So, uh, but, but Carl, hey, I appreciate you spending yeah. some time here and telling us the story and going back through and and explaining some things. And um, you know, I, I I just I can't appreciate 
appreciate you enough for uh, for doing that. Well, uh, I'm sure if the shoe was on the other foot, you'd probably did the same thing if you were served. Back in those days, patriotism was was not a new thing. It went around for a long time, and people really served their country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I still think people probably think you're you were crazy for for volunteering, but they probably appreciated it. <laughs> appreciate that there were some people that were willing to do that for sure. I volunteered what he called the what he called the for the Guana Canal and and uh, what he called the uh, the day Fourth of June. They knew there was a bunch of them was going to die. They went yeah. right. Yeah, you know. Well, Carl, I, I once again I want to thank you, and uh, you know I appreciate I appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm 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 proud to be on your show. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the From the Shadows podcast. Until next time, never shy away from the darkness or what may be lurking in the shadows. We are. Out. <laughs> A fortune forecast update brought to you by the Ohio Lottery. Well, hey there, Ohio. We're tracking a lot of jackpot activity over the next few days. We have rolling cash five and lucky for life in the forecast the entire week. But we also have major drawings for Powerball moving in, followed by scattered Mega Millions drawings through the week with some classic lotto drawings popping up here and there as well. There are big drawings every day, so stay tuned to the Fortune Forecast Center for the latest jackpot developments. Lottery players are subject to Ohio laws and commission regulations. Please play responsibly. Tackling home projects, Pathways has home equity products designed to fit your needs. Find out more at PathwaysCU.com. Pathways Financial Credit Union, your true financial partner. Member NCUA, equal housing lender, NMLS ID 237769.